Welcome to the Undisciplined Reading Series. It's me, Niku, and we're still doing Kelson's A Pure Theory of Law, and today we're talking about Chapter 2, Law and Morality, Law and Morals. So we saw in the first chapter that Kelson separates the science of law as the science of norms, as opposed to the natural science, right, or nature. He makes this distinction between law and the natural sciences. And then he also makes a distinction between law and morality. So the moral still being a social system of norms, but that it's different from the legal system. This is important for Kelsen. For a legal theory to be pure, it has to be separated from the natural sciences and it has to be separated from ethics or morality and in this chapter he goes in d deeper detail exactly what the difference between legal norms are and moral norms are and why it's important for a legal theory to keep these two separate so we know from the first chapter that Kelson definitely recognizes some overlap or similarity between law and morality their norms he says they regulate both internal behavior, thought processes, or behavior that affects only an individual, as well as external behavior, behavior that affects other people or society in the bigger sense. He says both law and morality regulate how people act in accordance with or counter to their own inclinations. You know, you're more likely to follow a rule, hopefully, than not to follow it. I think a kind of a Luhmannian way to phrase this would be to say that both systems of norms attempt to make certain patterns of behavior more probable. There's also a similarity between law and morality and how they are formed their norms both are formed by the will of the individuals as well as a kind of a custom you know we saw that law arises through custom but morality too it's always has a past it's a history it's how we do things right so they're also similar in how they come about so then the question becomes apparent so if they're both norms that try to regulate individual behavior and make certain acts more probable or patterns more probable, what are their differences? One difference is that Kelsen says that the legal order is usually centralized where the moral order is not. It's dispersed across society. There isn't one body that enforces morality, right? As opposed to the law. He, he says very primitive forms of law operate in this way, but not modern law. Um, with the exception, perhaps, he says, of public international law. And that's why he says it wouldn't be completely wrong to call international law international morals instead, because international law does not fit within the centralized element of uh, his definition of law, of a legal system. Um, I mean, that's that's debatable, right? Mm, it's a question, is he uh, interpreting the facts to fit his theory? Um, perhaps a little bit, I think. Um, but nevertheless, it is what it is. You can make up your own mind about that. A more important difference between law and morality is not in what they command or what they do, but in how they do it. Importantly, this means that morality, the how of morality, how it enforces itself, is through social approval or disapproval. You have esteem or disesteem in society. Law, on the other hand, as we saw in chapter one, works with coercion. 
um, you know, it's easy to imagine there are many laws that you can break that does not affect your esteem in society. It might even increase it if you break the law under certain conditions. But law enforces itself through coercion, through violence. That's its mechanism. So we see clearly that Kelsen makes a hard distinction between law and morality. And he says that we should not confuse these two. It causes conceptual problems. So then the question becomes, what should or what is, in his opinion, the relationship between law and morality then? Despite their, their shared form, normative form, their content and their method is different. So why, for Carlson, is it important to distinguish law and morality? He says that what's important is, and we said in chapter one, we refer to the transcendental, but morality can never have a claim to universality. Law theoretically could, although in practice we know we have different jurisdictions and law is willing to border itself within that and at least claim a universality within those borders. But morality tends not to do that. And the problem is if we start making legal judgment based on morality, the question very quickly becomes whose morality? The law we can point to. Morality is too relative. It is for Kelsen not a scientifically hard enough object, I think, to make that the basis of judgment or the basis of, uh, of law, legal judgment. You know, he tries to find an example of a, of a value, a moral value that would count as universal. And, you know, he can't even find that. The closest he gets is perhaps peace is, is a universal value. But then he says, but no, uh, history is history the modern society is full of examples of people who did not hold peace to be the highest value there are situations in which violence would be justified although peace would be uh, something to strive for it's not ultimate it's not universal he uses the example from the quote from Jesus, who says that I did not come to the world to bring peace. I came here to bring division. I come here to bring the sword. I come here to bring war between father and son. Uh, that's also a favorite quote of Zizek. So he says it's not obvious that peace is a universal value. So in this sense, because of the relativity of morals, it is scientifically meaningless to say that the law ought to be moral. We would never agree on that anyway. So, as you can guess, this means that morals are not a factor in whether a law or a legal norm is valid or not. But he qualifies this. He says that this does not mean that the law and its norms fall outside of what he calls the good, that law should still strive towards the good. But if we put it in this more specific sense of morality or ethics, it's too subjective to meaningfully strive towards that. And then I think an important nuance here that is not always represents it well enough I think is this distinction between if we talk about 
kind of the law from the inside, if I can put it that way. And then the law is observed from outside by the, the legal theorist or the legal scientist, not the practitioner who creates and interprets law, but the one who looks at the whole system, which is sort of what we're doing here and what Kelson did. Obviously, Kelson has this strong drive to be objective, scientific, empirical, uh, which, you know, that's open for a whole bag of critique by itself, but let's put that to the side for now. But he says that if we study the law academically from the outside, it's not the purpose of the legal theorist or the legal scientist to approve or disapprove of a particular law. The purpose is to describe it, right? There shouldn't be a value judgment in a purely descriptive exercise meant for understanding the system better. And through the internal logic of the law, a law remains valid only by its own metrics. Measuring it from the outside against morals cannot invalidate a law. The immorality of a law cannot invalidate it. We're, we're comparing different criteria. Uh, we're comparing apples and oranges here. And then Carlson justifies this or he goes further by sort of dabbling within the ethical trying to make ethical arguments for separating law and morality he says out of a kind of a political point of view he says it seems that the laws of one's own country always seem to be moral to you while the laws of another country seem to be immoral to you and that should already signal to you that something is amiss and points to the relativity of law so insisting that laws have to be moral or immoral justifies in some cases justifies intervention in a foreign country think of how human rights have been instrumentalized in that way you know we're going to intervene in another country because they're not applying human rights law they're not going about with the law in a moral way and that thus we have a legal justification to attack them also the value of peace being put to the side there so he says that moralizing over the law can be dangerous it can have uh, immoral effects and secondly he says that by insisting on the morality of the legal system it makes one uncritical of the of the legal system that you're living under. If you assume that it's morally justifiable, you are subscribing to this coercive natural order. And there's a there's a danger in that. Having a pure positivistic theory of the law makes you able to see the law for what it is and you can then without arguing over whether it's valid or invalid you can be more critical about it accepting that it's valid and do something about that rather than this uncritical acceptance of this violently imposed normative order so that's basically it for this chapter. It's quite a short one. I think it's the shortest one in the book. So this video is also a bit shorter, but it's also interesting because this idea, apart from the Grund norm thing, this positivist idea that law and morality is separate, we see that he does not pay that much attention. The next chapter on law and science is actually significantly longer that we'll do in the next video. But I think it's important not to be too reductive about this law and morality relationship in positivism or in Kelsen. I think it's a little bit more subtle, a little bit more nuanced. 
I think what it's easy to say that law and morality should not be mixed up. But I think what people perhaps miss sometimes is that we're not talking about separating it from only within the legal system, whether you're a lawyer or a, a, a judge or a legislator, whatever, and that it gives you carte blanche to be immoral. That's not the point. What is more important or more interesting here is keeping in mind that Kelson is writing this as an academic who takes the scientific rigor of what he's doing very seriously and is trying to make a, a cold, pure, scientific theory of law and that morality is not a scientific enough concept for him in describing the law and that this is not... The split between law and morality is not only within the legal system, but it's from this outside position that Kelson is doing it from where the split becomes important. So from the second order observation, if I can put it that way. And I think within the framework of what he's writing and what he's trying to do in his way of thinking, it makes sense. The point is that we can, of course, also do our second order observation of what Kelson is doing and criticize his assumptions, which hopefully we'll get to later. But Anyway, that's chapter two of A Pure Theory of Law. Uh, next video, we'll be doing chapter three, which deals with law and science. Thank you. I hope this was helpful and have a nice day.